I'm Philippe Portier, professor at the Ecole Pratique des Hautes Études in Paris. I'm very pleased to open this session devoted to the sociology of spirituality. The term spiritual uh, has existed in Christian language since the beginning, however, in theology, the term spiritual was used mainly in the 16th and 17th century, in particular in the works of Teresa of Avila and Saint John of the Cross. And a little bit later, in the reflections of the so-called French school of spirituality. But in the sphere of sociology, even if we can see attestations of, the, of this word in the works of Ernst Church, the term was imposed itself, especially in the 90s with the works of Wade Roof, and a decade later with the research of Paul Ilas and Linda Woodhead, who spoke in 2005 of a spiritual revolution to qualify the recent turn in systems of beliefs and practices. Following them, we have become accustomed to opposing the spiritual and the religious as two mutually exclusive categories. In this session, we will question the validity of this opposition. The question will be addressed by Giuseppe Jordan, at my right, who is a professor of sociology at the University of Padua. His research focuses mostly on interreligious dialogue, religious freedom, and spirituality as well, to which he has dedicated several works. Among his recent books, we can mention, in particular, Religious Freedom, Social Scientific Approaches, and Interreligious Dialogue from Religion to Geopolitics. His contributions will be discussed and thus privileged by three colleagues, three respondents, Stefania Palmisano, who is a professor of sociology at the University of Turin, Adriana Valente, director of research at the, the Institute of Social Policies in Rome, and, and Raquel Weiss, professor at the University of Rio Grande do Sul, Brazil. And she is here among us today. Thank you to be here from uh, a so long, uh, so long destination. So uh, we are now listening to Giuseppe. Thank you, Thank Giuseppe, you. for, you, your, for you. your talk. Thank you. So Philippe already gave the frame in which uh, I will say something about spirituality, about new spirituality. Before starting my presentation, let me just thank Professor Cipriani for inviting me. Please, could you please leave on the light over here? Is it, is it possible to la have centrale, the, the, la one light just to see some notes because I don't, okay? So, uh, thank you to Professor Cipriani for the uh, opportunity of being here to share some ideas with you. And, uh, and it's a privilege also to have, uh, at the beginning, four discussants, so to have uh, four respondents to a lecture is something that I never saw in a program, so it's... Uh, but, but now there are three, because uh, Helena cannot join us for personal reasons. So thanks indeed to Stefania Palmisano, Adriana Valente, and uh, Raquel Weiss for, for having read my presentation, which is included in the folder that Professor Cipriani sent us several times in the last weeks. And uh, so that presentation uh, is not something new, is a chapter in uh, a handbook uh, edited by David Yamane, uh, Handbook of Religion and Society. So uh, what is included in that, uh, in that um, file is uh, something that it has already been published under the title of spirituality. What Professor Cipriani did is to change the title. So it's not uh, uh, spirituality, but new spirituality. 
But what is Britech is not new. It's exactly what I wrote some years ago. Uh, Philippe uh, uh, gave us uh, uh, the frame in which uh, uh, a complete lecture on spirituality uh, should, uh, you know, uh, talk, which means from Theresa Davila, so which is really, you know, one uh, uh, of the reference point for those who study uh, Catholic spirituality. Uh, but we should go, you know, so uh, new spirituality is, is not referring to Teresa Davila, is referring more to Harry Potter or I don't know what. So I say let's from, from St. Teresa Davila to Harry Potter and many other things. So let's see how this concept, which is uh, everything but new, is not a new concept, is used to describe something that is new in the field of, of religion. I would, uh, uh, before, uh, before starting the presentation, I will just say what I intend by new spirituality. So whatever I said later is just uh, trying to explain this core statement. New spirituality, or spirituality as it is used in the sociological field today, new spirituality, according to me, means subjectivization subjectivization of the relationship with the sacred. Subjectivization of the relationship with the sacred. This means spirituality today. The old spirituality, let's say the spirituality of Santa Teresa d'Avila, the old spirituality was a kind of subjectivization, but it was referring to an objective institution. So she tried to distance herself from the objectivity of the institution, but that kind of spirituality was within an institution, the Catholic Church. You know, intention, negotiation processes, but within that institution. So the old spiritualities, by old spiritualities, I refer, you know, the Catholic, the Christian in general, but also Buddhist, uh, Hinduist, uh, you know, the old spiritualities are framed within an institution. I know that I am quite vague in saying this, but you know, just as understanding the differences. So I would say that old spirituality looked like uh, religiosity, if we uh, use the uh, terminology of Charles Glock. So those kind of spiritualities were a way of distancing the subject or groups the Dominicans, the Benedictines, you know, the, the Jesuits, uh, distancing from the institution, but always within the institution. New spiritualities is the way to uh, legitimize the relationship with the sacred based on the freedom of choice of the individual. So this is new spirituality. So the legitimization process is not based in, within the frame of an institution, but the legitimization process is based on the freedom of choice of the individual. The individual, the believer, can, the believer in whatever, the believer can legitimize his, her own way to dialogue, with the sacred, whatever the sacred is. So this is the core of my presentation. So in order to understand this, we need to go back a little bit to, this is a little bit of the outline, but it is like, you know, different pieces of a um, puzzle. So talking about spirituality is putting together different things, uh, and uh, there is a, a kind of coherence, but uh, I would like just to underline some main points in this uh, uh, discourse on, uh, on uh, spirituality. So I would like to underline the causes of spiritual turn, why we are talking about spirituality in a new way today. And by the way, uh, why uh, spirituality can be used um, against I mean, or intention with the term religion, 
So I will try to show that there is a continuum between the world, the concept of religion and the concept of spirituality. And just to clarify right away, I do not agree with the thesis of Paul Hillas and Linda Wood that uh, spirituality and religion are in a zero sum proposition. So as much as spirituality goes up, religion disappears. I will try to tell you why I do not agree with that position. And uh, I will underline some trait of the contemporary culture, which allows, you know, the growing of this uh, rhetoric on spirituality, which is the culture of the self. And uh, I will try also to underline briefly some institutional change. Then uh, I will say something about cultural pluralism, power and authority, because the word spirituality has to do above all with these uh, uh, three words, pluralism, cultural and religious pluralism, power and uh, authority. And then uh, spirituality as a resource of seeking the meaning of life. And finally, but I will not go in this direction today, uh, I just will mention something about the empirical phenomenon of spirituality, how it is difficult to study spirituality. You are well aware that many sociologists or social scientists doesn't want to hear the word spirituality because it is difficult to grasp First, the meaning, describe the concept, and then to do research. How can you do research in this, you know, with this vague concept? So, spirituality within the Western culture. As we just said, the, the word comes, I mean, the word spirituality is not a new word. Uh, it comes from, uh, from the... Uh, religious field, which means, uh, you know, I, I say uh, Western culture, because in the way we frame spirituality, for sure, it comes from the Western culture, even though there are spiritualities in all the traditional religions, you know, so it is not a monopoly of Christianity, but in the way we consider it comes from sure, for sure from the Western culture. And uh, uh, as uh, Philippe already mentioned, uh, it comes uh, from, you know, in the 60s, uh, uh, up till the 60s, it was a uh, 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 word used only within uh, specific groups, uh, uh, within a uh, very narrow circle of people, committed people, uh, within the religious traditions. And it entered in the sociological debate at the end, at the very end of the 20th century, uh, uh, you mentioned the roof, but we can mention Wuthno, we can mention uh, there are other people, we, we will see some of them. And then uh, I would say that uh, powerfully the concept of spirituality entered in the sociological debate with Paul Hillas and Linda Wooded. I think that was the book which made, you know, the debate, since it is a very, you know, it's a challenging book and it was meant to be a challenging book. So it, it, it made this world become, you know, recognized, visible within every kind of, of sociological debate. So the concept, as I said, uh, uh, there was a shift of meaning in this, uh, in this concept. And uh, what is interesting is try to understand, you know, th this is something that happened in many, with many other concepts. Try to think about the traditional definition of family. And, and try to understand how this concept, family, has changed in the last 30, 40, 50 years. So it, if you say family today, you need to specify what you mean by family. The same thing is what is happening with the concept of, um, of spirituality. So in, when you talk about uh, spirituality within the socio-religious um, analysis, uh, always there is this tension between uh, religion and spirituality. So are they mutually exclusive? Are they overlapping? Are we talking about the same thing? And uh, so th there are uh, 
we should take in account different elements in order to distinguish because they are not perfectly overlapping, even though they are not completely different, probably. So from the mm, sociocultural point of view, uh, there are uh, you know, different levels of analysis. First of all, the individual one and the collective one. But then, uh, as I said, the spirituality is uh, uh, the subjective way to legitimize the relationship with the sacred. If this definition is true, spirituality can be applied within religious traditions, at the border of religious tradition, and outside religious traditions. And there can be a spirituality without a reference to God. So, you know, the spiritual but not religious people. So there could be a, a reference to the sacred, whatever you mean by sacred, even without a reference to a personal God, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I take what uh, Luigi Berzano wrote, that uh, uh, there are religious spirituality, which is uh, with high or low intensity. There is a secular spirituality and a hybrid spirituality, which uh, affects uh, uh, multiple religions or lifestyles. We will go back to this when we will talk about multiple identities. Uh, if we want to frame this, uh, uh, the discussion of spirituality within a social change, you know, I would say that uh, spirituality shows that the categories we have used up to now to describe how individuals relate to the sacred are, are not sufficient, probably. You know, we, we used, for instance, sociologically speaking, we used the category of uh, um, secularization. And we know how this concept needs to be specified. And, uh, and we use the category of, uh, for instance, also religion. And we will see how religion is in trouble as a concept. So, uh, as I said, the book by Paul Hillas and Linda Wooded, uh, according to me, is the turning point uh, in which spirituality real comes to the fore. I mean, you know, sociologists uh, started to discuss and the debate was uh, still is quite heated because, uh, um, you know, those who intend to measure with the traditional categories, you know, religion, you know, they are in trouble if they want to measure spirituality. Uh, what, what, what is new with the concept of spirituality? Spirituality seems to be a more inclusive category, which means uh, spirituality includes all aspects of everyday life. And uh, I would say that the, the main uh, uh, thing here could be that uh, spirituality goes beyond uh, the secular profane divide. When you talk about spirituality, uh, it seems that uh, it, I mean, it is difficult to distinguish what is sacred, what is uh, 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 secular or profane. Uh, whatever can be seen as sacred, every aspect of life can be seen as sacred, and at the same time, every aspect of life can be seen as profane. So, uh, Secularization, uh, in some way, framed the relationship between religion and modernity uh, in a mutually exclusive way. It seems that modernity was not compatible with, uh, with religion, if you remember the first versions of, uh, of, the, uh, of the hypothesis of secularization you know, in the 60s. But then uh, in the 70s and in the 80s, this way of uh, interpreting the relationship between religion and modernity changed. So the discourse on spirituality is uh, the consequence of the, um, I mean, the, the not capability of the concept of secularization to explain this relationship between religion and modernity. 
there are good reasons to uh, be convinced that religion is changing, uh, you know, the reduction of religious vocation, decline in religious practices. But at the same time, in the 70s and in the 80s, there is all the discourse on new religious movements, then uh, the reassertion of the public role of religion. So the background in which uh, spirituality grows is exactly this uh, ambiguity of the change in the religious fields. For some aspects, religion seems to be, you know, disappearing, because if you confuse religion with uh, uh, the practice in the Western world, uh, religious practice is decreasing. But uh, if you understand religion in different ways, it is just changing, it's not uh, disappearing. So uh, the, within this debate, the concept of spirituality grows. So I would say that uh, spirituality is a new way of uh, understanding the relationship between modernity and the contemporary uh, world. Uh, you know, religion, sorry, religion and modernity or religion and the contemporary world. I don't know if you feel comfortable to use the word, uh, the label modernity for describing the contemporary world. Anyway, uh, religion is not disappearing, religion is changing, and the way it changes could be the spiritual way. So this is how I see the rise of this new term. Uh, I, I quoted Wuthnow because I think that he gave a contribution to this debate. So spirituality of dwelling and spirituality of seeking. And he said that uh, these two aspects are present in every person. So, uh, you know, they are just two movements present in the same person at different life stages. So in some period of your life, there could be a spirituality of seeking, which means, you know, going outside the boundaries of your own religion. And there is also a moment in your life when you feel more comfortable in dwelling. So the two aspects, you know, there is a dynamic there between what you are now, what you have been before, uh, your roots, which in many cases, you know, are uh, within a religious tradition or even outside a religious tradition, and uh, uh, what you are looking for when you put, you know, within the dynamic of the relationship with the sacred, when you put uh, the research, you research within your tradition and outside your tradition. And you put together different aspects. This is another issue which is uh, um, important to underline. Uh, what comes out from the uh, spirituality of seeking is not a coherent vision of the relationship with the sacred. You can pick and choose different things, so um, as everybody knows. So this is the, the, the new way of interpreting the, the relationship with the sacred. And uh, the criteria of legitimizing this new way of relating to the sacred is just, uh, you know, the, the freedom of choice of the individual. It works for me. So if, if it works for me, it is reliable, is what I, I need. I already said something about uh, the secularization, uh, I mean, how these concepts are in, uh, in a crisis. So we already saw these uh, uh, aspects. And uh, regarding, no, what is strange is uh, to see how people um, often do not feel comfortable in uh, saying that they are religious. I mean, the word religion is becoming ambiguous, is attached to uh, the logic of identity, ethnic identity. Uh, it is attached to violence. I think that what happened, you know, the 9-11th uh, attacks, uh, you know, changed a little bit the way we talk about uh, religion. So uh, probably, uh, people today feel more comfortable to talk about spirituality, even though they do not know exactly what they mean when they say, I am spiritual. We will see this uh, 
with uh, another observation. So the concept of religion can be in crisis for this uh, reason. And, uh, you know, uh, religion is often used uh, for uh, political reasons, uh, even today. And it is interesting that it is a, a process going on even in the Western world, which means uh, uh, um, in different countries, uh, religion, I'm talking about Western world, religion is, is, is used, uh, think about populism and how populism uh, get along very well with, uh, with, uh, with religion. So people are searching for something that is uh, inspiring from their life. They are searching for meaning and uh, for some of them, religion is still a good resource of meaning. But for many other, religion is not working anymore because it is clear that it is a tool of identity discourses or a tool for, you know, political power, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Here you have uh, some author. I mean, I, you know, I start from Blackman, which goes back to the 60s. But I think that uh, there is a long way to, um, to arrive to the change of meaning in uh, in, in, in the way we intend the relationship with, with the sacred. So the secularization led to the growth of spirituality. Then uh, uh, there is, a, a, at a certain point, and this aspect should be studied by historians and by sociologists also, uh, at a certain point, uh, the uh, path of spirituality uh, splitted from the path of religion. So, as I said, uh, probably the terroristic attack, 9-11, uh, was one of these points. But there are many points in which uh, uh, spirituality, you know, um, take another uh, itinerary different from the one of, uh, of religion. So there is Vuthno, then, of course, the uh, book of Ilas and Wooded. And then uh, other authors, I just quote uh, Meredith McGuire, Aileen Barker, and uh, uh, I wrote about the democratization of the sacred, which means uh, spirituality, if we understand it as a power relationship, if spirituality recognizes the freedom of choice of the individual, I think that spirituality uh, can be described of the democratization of the relationship with the uh, sacred, which means everybody is free to choose whatever he or she likes to believe. As I said, I am not, uh, um, I don't agree with those who think that uh, uh, spirituality and religion are mutually exclusive. I think that uh, uh, they just uh, underline a different way to legitimize this relationship with uh, the sacred. And there are many, you know, in the 60s and in the 70s, there are many social events that uh, mm, that pushed toward this new way of legitimizing the relationship with the sacred. The criticism against every kind of authority, it's a clear, you know, beginning of this, of this process. Uh, among the many things that can be underlined in this shift, I would say the importance of the body, for instance, the importance of the feelings, uh, the importance of emotions. Uh, usually in some kind of spirituality, uh, you know, the body was, uh, you know, something that could be understood as dangerous. And uh, feelings, you know, there, there was not the respect of feelings or... So this uh, holistic, uh, this holistic milieu as it has been uh, as it has been uh, defined, is the new frame in which uh, we can understand uh, spirituality. So in the past, we have different spiritualities. By the way, talking with the expert of uh, uh, religious spiritualities, I mean, uh, expert of Hinduism, Judaism, uh, 
Islam and of course Christianity, they say the new spirituality is nothing new. So what you sociologists define as a new spirituality is nothing new because it is just what the traditional uh, spirituality tries to do, which I don't agree, but uh, it is, you know, you can also say that it is nothing new what is happening now. They tried, if you think, you know, the way they renewed the religious way of thinking those years, so going back to the 13th century, 14th century, 15th century, so they marked something new those days. And this is exactly what the new discourse on spirituality is marking something new now. I already said something about the theological spirituality and then sociological spirituality. I, I go back again to this you know, difference that uh, the traditional spiritualities, the religious spiritualities, uh, they have the reference point, uh, which is uh, the traditional religion. The new spiritualities, uh, the reference point, again, is the freedom of choice of the individual. So this is what is uh, new. There is something interesting to underline here talking about religion. Uh, the historian Martin Marty underlined that in the 60s and in the 70s, and this is something that could be happening even now, uh, the uh, religious uh, thought, try, the, the vocabulary used by the religious thought underlined the, you know, the discourse on poverty, the social and political issues, discrimination, mm -hmm the world in Vietnam, in the US, and internationally. So those days, religions used a kind of social vocabulary. And they lost probably the spiritual aspect of the relationship with, uh, with the sacred. And according to Martin Marty, there is where, you know, the new spirituality came, came out. So, as I said, spirituality is the new way we label the relationship with the sacred, which doesn't happen only within churches, temple, but it happens everywhere. So you can uh, go to gym and to see spirituality uh, going, you know, wherever, in sport activities, uh, at the workplace, uh, leisure, whatever. So, I mean, uh, you can see, you know, different kind of aspects of social life labeled with the word spirituality, which was not the case with the word religion. I mean, religion was quite exclusive regarding the other aspects of social life. Spirituality is very inclusive. And again, from the methodological point of view, you can say, you know, if it is so inclusive, how would you define it? This is the this discourse of spirituality is changing, for instance, the images of God. So God is not a judge anymore. God is a brother. Brad has a feminine image. Um, so these personal relations, which was true also in the past, but in the past was not so spread. Now it is, it is becoming, you know, part of the everyday life vocabulary. Again, from the methodological point of view, uh, this is the uh, problem, how to find boundaries between the two concepts, religion and, uh, and spirituality. So all the phenomenon of new age movements uh, fall within this category. And it is clear that Zimbabwe spoke about uh, the fuzzy and the unfuzzy talking about this, uh, this concept. Uh, from the cultural point of view, uh, I, mm, I would go back to uh, the differentiation between materialistic and post-materialistic values. So ingle art, I go back to the 70s. So probably uh, 
simplifying, I hope not oversimplifying, we can consider religion like, you know, something very material, uh, codified, dogmas, rituals, something that is imposed. Uh, spirituality in this way can be considered as something post-materialistic. And uh, if you uh, put together this sensitivity with, for instance, the quality of life, the interest for the environment, and of course the freedom, you know, the personal freedom, the self-realization, the well-being, the therapeutic language, this is the new language of spirituality. So, you know, the well-being perspective, the well-being perspective is changing completely, uh, not only the way spirituality is talking about the relationship with the sacred, but even the churches, so this is interesting, the churches, the traditional churches are changing their vocabulary in, you know, in, in telling their stories. So it is not just changing the way of believing, is changing the way of making belief. So the churches are, are, are how can I say, are taking this perspective in uh, uh, telling, uh, you know, their message. And here we have the, what, you know, you know, the spiritual, the spiritual revolution. And uh, according, you know, according to Hilas and Wooded, uh, spirituality will take the place of religion and, uh, you know, the mm, research done in Kendall, it has been criticized from every aspect. Uh, the democratization of the sacred and the cultural pluralism, cultural and religious pluralism. I think that, I mean, I am studying uh, these last um, months, years, the relationship between religion and human rights. I think that the uh, reasoning of rights is changing the way people perceive uh, even the relationship with the sacred. As I said, spirituality is the way a person freely frame the uh, relationship with the sacred. I think that spirituality is a, a flexible concept which allows everybody to define the relationship with the sacred in accordance with the rights of the individual. And uh, even the, the, the traditional religions has to come to terms with this new perspective of believing, which is, you know, the, 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 the rights of the individual, not only in the sense of freedom of religion, which is, you know, the, the, the freedom of believing in the public sphere, but freedom of religion is also freedom of the believer within his own religious tradition. So the concept of spirituality probably uh, comes to terms easily with the perspective of pluralism, religious pluralism, and, uh, and uh, uh, the perspective of rights. Just uh, one word, and I conclude, uh, regarding doing research on spirituality. Doing research on spirituality is really difficult. And uh, uh, I did not do much research, just something, but here we have a good uh, scholars. Uh, so now they, 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 the respondents are experts on this field. And, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think we should uh, uh, try to invent new uh, tools of research. I, I didn't read, but I will read an article which just came out in the Journal for the Scientific Study of Religion. Feng Gang Yang is uh, the author of this article, one of the two authors of this article. And uh, I, uh, we, we do need a new instrument of research. It is not possible to do research with uh, the uh, scale of a Glock which was perfectly working in the 60s, perfectly, you know, perfectly from the Western perspective. But it was working in the 60s and in the 70s, but now it is clear it doesn't work anymore. 
So uh, it is easy to measure if a person go to mass every week, just to give you an example. That is quite easy, but it is not sufficient to say how uh, the relationship with the sacred is. So we should uh, invent, I would say this is the, 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 the right word, we should invent new categories in order to um, grasp how the relationship with uh, uh, men and women of contemporary world relate to the sacred. And grasping what the spirituality means is really a challenging for those, for the social scientists who want to do research on this uh, field. Thank you. Um, Professor Palmisano from the University of Torino. Thank you. Thank you, for, thank you to you. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. A month ago, when I was writing this comment about Giuseppe Giordano's lecture on new spirituality, the dean of my department rang to inform me that uh, the department board, my department board, I work at the University of Turin, had had a long discussion about a workshop that I have required permission to sponsor on the theme of spirituality. The issue was raised because this workshop was entitled, not very originally, Mind, Body and Spirit. So I discovered that um, some colleagues criticized the word spirit because they found it inappropriate, was inappropriate in their eyes to scientific debate. I was angry and very disappointed. International debate about the contemporary study of sociology of religion and spirituality is so widespread, 30 years of debate, that it is hard to believe that we are still here to defend the sociological study of spirituality. As Giuseppe told us, many, many struggles have been already fought. Uh, do you remember the, the crucial debate that Giuseppe mentioned about the spiritual revolution, the spiritual turn and the sociology of religion, and also uh, some uh, discussion in some scholarly associations about substituting the label of sociology of religion with that of sociology of spirituality. In Italy, too, theoretical reflection and empirical research is so widespread, is so developed that some Italian colleagues complain that spirituality is the only subject around which conferences are organized. So I'm here today, thanks to Professor Cipriani, and happy to discuss uh, the theme once again. In order to understand the controversy related to the concept of spirituality, some clarifications are needed. Giuseppe was the first Italian scholar to take the spirituality topic seriously. In doing so, especially in his 2016 chapter, the one we have to read for today, he argues that firstly, we need to focus on the direction that the term spirituality has taken within the Western culture. And secondly, we have to discuss some important point in the sociological debate about definitional issues and the relationship between religion and spirituality. He focused a lot about the relationship between religion and spirituality, and I totally agree with him, because even for some sociologists of religion, the relationship between religion and spirituality is uh, controversial and also contradictory. Um, for some others, is uh, on the contrary, very pacific, but always the relationship between the two is very uh, intimate. Religion and spirituality are very intertwined. In my book, uh, the one is circulating, I, I can't see it, but oh, okay, wonderful, wonderful. In my book, I use the expression uh, frenemies, 
which is uh, an neologism to say friends plus enemies. Because even though their relationship could be conflictual or pacific, it's always very intimate. Why is the concept of spirituality so challenging? Giuseppe answers in line with other sociologists who argue that the concept is not well defined, lacking therefore heuristic power, and very difficult to use in empirical research. But the originality of Giuseppe thought uh, can be found, first of all, in his analysis of the curious journey that the word spirituality have done. We know that the, the origins of the world can be traced back to Christianity. And in order to demonstrate the difference between uh, the holistic uh, spiritualities of today and the idea of spirituality in Christianity, Giuseppe has traced the term's journey from theology to the popular uh, concept used in common speech since the 1960s. And this analysis has inspired the image, which I use in my book, uh, of Lazarus Taxon. Lazarus Taxon, the concept elaborated by paleontologists, identifies a presumably extinct species which suddenly made a reappearance. Why do I use this concept in order to speak about spirituality? As Giuseppe told us, the term has been brought back to life as Lazarus was raised from the dead by Jesus. The concept of spirituality, we know, arose from theology, but after thriving for centuries, it gradually disappeared, as Giuseppe showed us. Surprisingly, however, it came back to life. It was resurrected. So this is the Lazarus effect. It was resurrected, albeit in a different habitat from the original one, it was not theology, it was everyday life, contemporary society. And to understand the success of this world, it's useful to mention its historical background without entering into detail today because we don't have time here. It's important to remember that the history of contemporary spirituality may be traced back to the 1960s American social scene when the idea that seeking the sacred could be carried out outside traditional religion uh, became common. This was the period of a fertile cultural fusion. Numerous gurus arrived on Pacific and Atlantic coasts, bringing ancient oriental wisdom. As George Harrison, the Beatles guitarist, said, the world is ready for a mystical revolution, a discovery of the God in each of us. So the term spirituality started to indicate extra-religious relationship with the sacred, a sense which it still retains. Although Giuseppe does not mention this point, I believe that another problem relating to the concept of spirituality is what I have called the paradox of invisibility. Despite its spread, spirituality appears in the eyes of many even to some uh, uh, of the scholars themselves, as a niche, scarcely relevant phenomenon. Spirituality usually, unlike traditional religions, has no churches, has no house of worship or organizational structures. Sometimes it expressed in private individual practices, at other time in informal groups and associations. Therefore, spirituality runs the risk of not being visible or being invisible. Behind this risk, there, is, uh, there lies a cultural habit. Since we were born and have grown up in a Catholic context, uh, we're used to associating the sacred with formal organization and immediately recognizable symbols. Among the problems with the concept of spirituality, I don't have time either uh, to mention the prejudice, uh, recognizable not only in the Italian sociology, of false spirituality versus authentic religion, which animates some scholars, 
And I'd like to ask Giuseppe for a, a comment about this point. Another merit of Giuseppe's work is to have captured the cultural relevance of spirituality regardless its numerical significance in its numerical scope. Okay, there is no spiritual revolution today. Nevertheless, it is important to study spirituality because it allows us to deepen the effect of the mechanism of democratization of the sacred, uh, which Giuseppe mentioned. So how spirituality is changing also traditional religions. We, we, we spoke about how traditional churches are changing. So it's important to consider the role of alternative spiritualities or contemporary spiritualities in changing the role of the church today. And I would add another, I like to add another reason uh, which makes the study of spirituality paramount. If one is able to grasp its influence in both religious and secular contexts, it is clear that it has acquired visibility and it can impact in contemporary society on contemporary society in many different ways. My main regret is that Giuseppe did not develop his analysis further by taking some case studies as test cases. In the book, which is uh, um, Contemporary Spiritualities in Italy, which is there, I think. Um, okay, wonderful. Um, Nicola Pannofino, my co-author, and I identify three spiritual narratives emerging through the study of nine, nine, nine Ks. And on the basis of this study, we identify three spiritual narratives, which are the spirituality of nature, the spirituality of well-being, and the spirituality of mystery. We show that these narratives are not only abstract vision of the reality, on the contrary, they are action programs requiring a transformative intervention on society. In other words, spiritual practices not only reflect changes in society as a whole, but they are themselves a vector of change and innovation capable of impacting different sectors. And in our book, we examine the effect of spirituality in Italy on cultural, political, economic, and social levels. And I'd like to conclude with an important example of the impact of spirituality in everyday life, particularly in the clinical setting, because this is the topic on which I wor I'm working at the moment. I'm referring to the recent success of the practice of spiritual care. I don't know if you are familiar with this expression, spiritual care or spiritual assistance in hospitals, in hospices. And this was a subject that was traditionally studied in nursing literature, but it is becoming very important today and it is becoming an object of study in the sociology of religion, in the sociology of spirituality and in the sociology of health. So I think it's very important as an example of how contemporary spirituality is impacting everyday life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stefania, for this uh, discussion. Um, what is important, I think, in, our, in your discussion is uh, the fact that uh, we, we attend a, a democratization of the sacred with uh, three main narratives. I didn't know these things, but uh, nature, well-being, and mystery. Uh, very often we speak about spirituality without defining what is spirituality. And with these narratives, we attempt to uh, find a real content of spirituality. That's a great, uh, a great uh, jump 
towards the to, towards uh, the meaning of that. Thank you very much. Well, uh, the floor now is uh, to Adriana Palante, which is uh, who is uh, uh, director of research at the Institute of Social Policies in Rome. Thank you very much, Adriana. <coughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Roberto Cipriani, for all these. And first of all, I want to thank and also to uh, reassure uh, uh, Jordan that it was really a pleasure to read again uh, uh, the, the documents uh, of him and of Palmisano that circulated um, for this session. Uh, it is also... Um, ah, sorry, I have to... Uh, sorry. It's also um, a great pleasure for me uh, uh, to have received uh, such important tools that uh, allowed me to, to follow some reflections uh, in the age of my interest between sociology and philosophy. So uh, I thank particularly also for this. Um, uh, the, um, I move from some of the interesting premises, the concept of spirituality uh, that was born in uh, theological ambit, uh, but then has been used sometimes also in dialectic position with that of religion. Uh, the 60s as the moment in which uh, uh, in people grow up uh, these exigences emerged this exigence of uh, new spirituality. Uh, but uh, I am also grateful uh, because uh, um, Jordan also wrote down that the moment of rupture of the subjective turn is uh, in any way described in a continuum of continuity that made this possible. And this gives me the chance to, uh, to wonder uh, if there are other forms of spiritualities uh, witnessed uh, uh, earlier, before the um, 60s, uh, and if they have something in common, and if they have something to say. Uh, I make a particular case, I make a um, literacy uh, excursion uh, in the work of uh, Etty Hillesum. Uh, she was a um, Okay, uh, ah, and the main issues so that I would like to um, to put together uh, today uh, is the, the the context of the freedom of the individual, very important for a better understanding of the model knowledge values and social practice. Uh, what Etty Hillesum uh, could uh, catch from a system of meaning, just uh, a look to some metaphors, and a final consideration on uh, dwelling and seeking. Uh, he, who was uh, Etty Hillesum, um, Esther was uh, her name, she was a young uh, Jewish lady, uh, living in the period of the persecution of Jews in Amsterdam during German occupation. Um, she uh, is considered sometimes both from Catholic Church, and uh, we will discover why, um, but her characteristics is of uh, finding her own spirituality besides that of the uh, church of origin and of other churches. Her diary and letters uh, are testimonials of uh, an exceptional and unbelievable spiritual journey. Uh, some commenters noticed that there is an initial date and a final date, unfortunately with her death, of this journey that is really particularly evident uh, when then, uh, on voluntary basis, reached the transit camp on Westerberg and then Auschwitz. Uh, this diary is, uh, uh, offers us uh, a kind of uh, great big uh, history of life. Uh, it's not one example, but it's really uh, full of findings and is interesting to analyze with the tools that have been offered by new spiritualities uh, theoricians. Um, uh, in particular, I would uh, um, analyze the context of, of Etty uh, using, uh, I, I do not use the, um, the models uh, um, of Schwartz, Inghart, and others because uh, I'm considering more individual and private 
person. So I use uh, uh, KVP knowledge value uh, social practices model that we have been used in several uh, um, uh, projects uh, in the field of education. Uh, um, in the field of education and. Uh, um, <coughs> Uh, it, it is uh, uh, interesting to see how the individual choice and the journey that Etty afforded uh, go through the three, um, the three points. Unfortunately, uh, uh, the double side arrows are not visible here, but uh, you should imagine uh, uh, several double uh, arrow, um, double side arrow that uh, would mean the interaction between these uh, uh, three poles and also help um, to uh, recognize how how time has going um, and uh, the individual spiritual journey has enriched much. By the social practice uh, 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 side, we see, we see uh, included some of behaviors, rules, action of all institutions from religious institutions. Uh, uh, Etty was not, uh, and her family were not uh, observant uh, from the Nazi occupation to those of own community. And finally, uh, these have been enriched by the spiritual and body practices under the guide of Spears. Uh, from the knowledge uh, on the knowledge poll, we see we see um, we include all formal education of Etty, but all the uh, we could say cultural pluralism that were on which she was embedded, uh, she uh, loved uh, uh, and cited Agostino, Saint Paul, as well as Buddhism, as well as Koran. Uh, she, but inside this cultural pluralism um, uh, that uh, allowed her spirituality to grow up uh, is very important also the literary and uh, poetical part, um, uh, uh, reference uh, particularly to Rilke and Dostoevsky are essential in her uh, spiritual journey. On the other, on the third poll, we have the values. Uh, we know that there are several frames related to, uh, to value um, from Platon and Aristotle and on, but uh, I've chosen these that I present here um, because uh, it includes uh, an element that I think it is interesting uh, among the other tools, that is that of the choice. So um, uh, val um, values as element of a shared symbolic system um, in which uh, there is a, a, a criterion for selection among the alternative of orientation. I like this uh, definition from Castelfranchi and also helps us understanding the spiritual path. Uh, among her values, uh, a great concern for literature uh, that uh, went all over her life, but uh, the choice inside this, because at the end, uh, she decided to leave her studio and to realize with other people in the transit, uh, um, in the transit um, uh, camp of Westerberg. Um, uh, so uh, in her diary is very evident the, uh, the movement, the, the journey from self-absorption to self-fulfillment in direction of humanity, openness and care. Uh, considering the complex system of meaning and behaviors, uh, I, I don't talk, we have no time related to rituals, that is also a, an important element that we can see from her diaries, but uh, uh, it's interesting to consider the metaphor that she uses. Uh, the metaphor of journey, besides her own journey, is always present in her diary. Uh, we know that is uh, one of the main metaphors of all religions, that the Old Testament is uh, full of this uh, uh, metaphor. Um, that uh, uh, also signs the, the path of Eti. At the beginning of her journey, um, uh, the idea of traveling 
is uh, keeping distance from something that seems irritating you, uh, but also considering that uh, you look outside what you can't find inside, so that everything only comes from inside. Then, uh, after some months, uh, uh, traveling uh, becomes the landscape of own soul. And uh, uh, in 1942, um, she wishes good trip clearly referring to uh, her interior work. Um, and uh, it is very touching how this metaphor goes close to the word travel used um, with reference to the restriction of travel for Jewish people in that period. Uh, the metaphor of the travel uh, uh, follows with that of the shipwreck. Also, we have a lot of testimonies all over religions and particularly in the Old Testament. Uh, but here there is a particular uh, way, new way of, uh, I think, of reconsidering the way she described this metaphor that occurs several times in her diary, um, uh, uh, debating her taking part in a job to the Jewish council. She, um, she write, uh, like, crowding onto a small piece of wood uh, uh, on an endless ocean after a shipwreck and then saving oneself by pushing others. This uh, special uh, um, sensibility uh, goes on uh, describing what she would have done. Uh, I would much rather join those who prefer to float on their backs for a while uh, and then go down with a prayer. Uh, it is interesting in Etty's metaphor that we not only uh, 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 see the use of exegetic, of uh, literal metaphor as explaining the text, but as some authors have uh, noticed the, um, with reference to science studies, uh, metaphor may also be used for building knowledge as creative of knowledge for the continuous development of theories. And really it seems the way Etty is is using her uh, metaphors. We come to a very important of the tool that, that uh, uh, new spiritualities uh, uh, give us to observe how uh, the sacralization of self uh, took place uh, uh, in some of the writings. Um, uh, uh, what is God? We have seen several times from results of surveys, a lot of definitions, uh, the, the, the highest variety of definitions of God. Uh, this that act gives uh, in the, during her journey are really interesting. Uh, the interiority, of course, the interiority Jordan was talking about uh, is uh, central. Uh, that part of myself, the deepest and the richest uh, part in which I repose, is what I call God, is what she says. Um, and then uh, uh, God is also related to the others, not only uh, herself inside, but also the others. And uh, here, uh, it is uh, rather interesting, the one of the moments of the choice, uh, it wouldn't uh, do, would it, to live an idyllic life with you in a sheltered study. Still, I confess, it is truly difficult to carry you intact with me. And then uh, another important concept, uh, that of needing to help God. If God does not help me to go on, then I shall have to help God. Um, uh, uh, and again, I shall merely try to help God as best as I can. And if I succeed in doing that, then I shall be of use to others as well. So uh, it is very interesting in uh, continuing building uh, knowledge, uh, taking with her all the tradition, uh, considering God not only as destroyers or savers, but uh, a God who is to be saved and not to be destroyed. Um, in conclusion, we uh, have seen how um, personal freedom is, has been really uh, an important tool in reconsidering values, knowledge, and social practices. Uh, one other issue uh, 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 seems to be interesting related to the choice and the struggle of Etty. A struggle that not, does not mean feeling worse because she felt actually much better uh, during her journey. 
uh, but uh, struggle as a research struggle. And um, uh, when Balzano said uh, uh, about the supermarket uh, of religions, uh, what, what, uh, the, about the, the very easy way of living a religious and choosing other religions uh, um, and uh, being much more related, uh, uh, not really related to, to, to seeking into spirituality, um, uh, uh, it is, I think, very interesting that uh, choice and struggle uh, seems to me some indicators of the um, of the intention uh, of a firm intention of eti of seeking her spirituality and not using uh, doctrines as supermarket. Uh, she made a personal search for which there for her there was no interest in detecting the degree of belonging and the belief in the different faiths. And she had uh, this special relation with the inner good that Isabella Dinolfi noticed uh, um, how words like interiority, interior, intimate, etc., are so strictly close with other words uh, that we find uh, in the new uh, spirituality. Uh, um, input as autonomy, uh, space, and freedom. And so, uh, I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, uh, Adriana, for that, uh, for that comments and that intervention. It was uh, very, very interesting. And we, we saw, listening to you, that uh, the the theme of spirituality uh, was already a reference in the literature before the 60s or the 70s, during the uh, Second World War, but also we can add during the 19th century. If we, we follow Charles Taylor, for instance, we have in the Romantic literature a link between spirituality and authenticity, intimacy too, and uh, literature can be a, a real custody to study the importance of spirituality even in a religious time. That's very interesting and you, uh, your, your, your presentation was very compelling in that respect. Thank you very much for that. It was uh, foreseen to, to, to welcome Elena Villassa from the University of Porto. Unfortunately, she, she cannot be with us today, uh, maybe another, another day. Uh, uh, for personal reasons, she, she, can, she cannot be with us today. But we are going to, to listen to, to, to Raquel, uh, Raquel Weiss. Uh, who, who comes from the University of Rio Grande do Sul, Brazil. Thank you very much. Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you, first of all, to Roberto and the International Center for the Sociology of Religion for uh, allowing me to carry my research here at Rome and also to La Sapienza for granting the uh, the fellowship that allowed me to, to spend here three months, and that's the reason why I'm following this conference in Rome, otherwise it would be impossible, considering Brazil is too far away. Anyway, I'm very happy to, to discuss with you today. This is not my main topic of research. I'm coming from, from sociology of morality, but I uh, somehow took uh, the new spiritualities as a material of research. So I hope coming from a different field, we can establish uh, perhaps a dialogue. Oh. Uh, here is just a map of what was said before about this. Uh, uh, as far as I'm, I understand, one of the key, the, the key topics when we talk about new spiritualities, is this complex relation with religion. And here I try to summarize the, the, the most important positions. And somehow this, this discussion made me to, uh, to remind a classical discussion. Um, in the, the 80s, 
in 1920 about magic's magic versus religious religion. Uh, James Frazen, uh, Baron Spencer, uh, for instance, they were scholars uh, carrying empirical research on religion, and there is there was this very important uh, debate uh, about the difference between magic and religion. And this theme occupied the classical sociologist for a very long time. Um, I mention this because as far as I, I understand the, the ongoing debate on, on this topic, um, the Durkheimian solution to this debate, to this conflict, um, might help us to address a few, a few aspects in this, in this debate. Um, basically, he tried to not establish a hierarchical uh, comparison between both phenomena. Because, for instance, Fraser, he was trying to say religion is more important than magic. Um, but according to Durkheim, both are collective phenomena. But a key difference is that religion in the way he conceives it, is a set of ideals and practices that gather people around a moral community. So moral community is the key difference between magic and religion. Uh, and magic somehow is related to what, to what we now call spirituality. It has a collective dimension in the sense that the magician, for instance, he needed to be um, legitimized by a community, but it does not require a permanent community to exist. Uh, it's possible to have a very personal connection to the magic. You can go and to uh, use the, the services of a magician and come back to your home and carry your, your life normally. You don't have further uh, commitments. So somehow, I, I'm, I'm not saying magic and spirituality are the same, but that debate somehow um, can help us to find a more conceptual, uh, more refined conceptual tools to, to this debate. Um, but what I'm going to address um, in, this, uh, in this comment uh, is the two main uh, critiques towards the new spiritualities that I found in the literature. The first is that new spiritualities are too individualistic and represent uh, a challenge to collectivity. And the second one is that the beliefs and practices can be freely chosen. So my problem here is with the idea of freely chosen. Of course, there is autonomy, but the idea of freedom is not, it's not as if you can simply go to a market and you can find any kind of services or beliefs and, or practices. There are a few constraints reg regarding um, choosing what spirituality to, to, to follow. So um, my, my point of departure is uh, Cipriani work on diffuse religion and the religion of values. Because what I, I found out is that uh, these uh, new spiritualities, uh, the ones I work with that I call female new spiritualities, they are a way to refuse the religion that is the most uh, the most important tradition in at least in Brazil, that is Christianism. Before it was Catholicism. Now we are changing to a more Protestant version of Christianism. So it's some is a way to contest the diffused values based upon a Catholic tradition. So religion is present, is directly related to these new spiritualities, but in a conflictive way. On the other hand, these movements, they, they take references from other established religions that are not very spread 
in Latin America, in Brazil. For instance, Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism. Uh, so there is this very complex relation to religion. It is present, but at the same time, it's not, it's not the same. But um, the main conflict is with the diffused religion because we are, we are talking about values here. So, in some aspects, it defies religions. In another ones, it depends upon religions, because religions are somehow the sources for the practices and beliefs of the so-called new spiritualities. Um, and another uh, important uh, um, point that I, I, I found is that there is this strange combination of autonomy and, and uh, authenticity, and I use those words in the sense uh, that Charles Taylor and Alessandro Ferrara discuss it. So somehow it is based upon this contemporary ideal of authenticity and autonomy, but at the same time, they value very ancient traditions. This is not very easy to, to, to make sense of all of this, but uh, there is a, an, an underlying logic that I'm trying to, uh, to, to grasp. So my focus was on the theme of femininity. That, that's how I selected the groups that I, that I studied. So here I, I, I bring a few uh, ethical or moral implications that I managed to, to, to find in the groups that I studied. First is the commitment with feminism but they, at the same time they have a, a, a very tense relation to feminism in its more liberal uh, uh, approach. But they are committed to feminist causes. Uh, another aspect is a strong connection to uh, ecology. Uh, a strong um, intention to provide mutual help to those women belonging to the same groups, but also to people uh, that are not part of the, this, the community, but that, in, that somehow uh, is in need of help. Another point uh, is that they value indigenous traditions. I mean indigenous as autochthonous people in case of Brazil, for instance, the um, Guarani people, etc. I will show, uh, so, uh, show some pictures after. And all of the groups I research are strongly against capitalism uh, and also against consumerism. So I, I thought that was interesting because many times when we uh, read about new spiritualities, we, we read they follow a very uh, mercadological bias. So in the groups that I studied, uh, that was not what I found. And these groups also have very severe duties and very compelling rituals. So uh, why I'm stressing this dimension? Because I studied not people alone practicing their own spiritualities, but I went to, to, to look for groups that gather women around those, those practices. And okay, there is freedom of choice, but you also find many informal ob obligations. They are informal, but they are very compelling. If you do not do those things, you don't. You cannot really belong. You are somehow a stranger. Uh, concerning the rituals, for instance, circular dances, uh, sharing intimate experiences, washing each other feet or or, or the hair, uh, and about the du the duties to collect menstrual blood, for instance, not shaving legs. Huh? Uh, in Brazil, not shaving legs uh, is a is, is a, it's not easy to, to do that for, for women. Um, wear skirts or dresses in the rituals. 
and also to keep an altar, but an altar with various goddesses from different traditions. You can have Kali, you can have Saint Mary, you can you can have many different goddesses in the same altar because what is important is what the goddess represent to you. Um, and basically, my field work was with Western Tantra, with two different groups, uh, with the, the so-called the serpent way that is inspired in Taoist traditions, but also in different traditions. The Nacion Pachamama movement that is based in pre-Inca tradition, so is based upon traditions that were kept safe even during the Inca Imperium. So they are very, very ancient traditions. And the sacred feminine. I, I now will be bring a few pictures about this uh, serpent way. This picture uh, is from the Instagram of this, of this group. So I took the pictures there. It's how they present themselves. And they, they have this very uh, intriguing combination of Taoist tradition, Western science, and Greek goddesses. When you take part in, in, the, in the events, all those references are combined with a particular focus on sexuality. Uh, another picture from uh, their Instagram. Uh, now, uh, those others are pictures that I took during my field work uh, from this other group that is Nacion Pachamama. Nacion uh, Pachamama is based on, in Peru, but they are all over in Brazil. So I conducted a research in a community close to, to my city, Porto Alegre, and also made interviews and etc. Um, what is interesting about this, this tradition is that they, they live in communities, but they also have um, workshops for people that are interested in know uh, a bit more about those practices. One of the, the most well-known practices is the 21 days practice, uh, where you have to make a fast, you know, you, you have to, to perform a few rituals to purify your body and etc. And another very curious element is that they are very um, committed to political issues. For instance, um, this, uh, this picture below, is th they were uh, together in a, um, in, a, in a manifestation to preserve uh, water. It was against the privatization of water. Mm -hmm. uh, so they are, uh, they are together uh, making politics. And uh, the, the picture above is a, a ritual performed with women who lost their children before they were born, either because they performed an abortion or because they had some uh, pregnancy problems. So uh, it, it's, it's, um, it's difficult to grasp what this really is about because they try to cover all the aspects regarding women life and politics uh, in, in, in a very um, complex way. And now my, my former, my, my, my final example, it was um, a movement belonging to the so-called sacred feminine. And I bring here, uh, it's a group that created uh, this agenda, it's called Mandala Lunar, or moon mandala. It began as a, a dream from three um, friends. They decided to create this instrument to help women to know themselves better. And now this, um, this agenda provides employment to more than 50 women and it became a political instrument, uh, uh, an instrument for education. They have um, many uh, social kinds of works and they try to, uh, to open space for, art, for artists and uh, writers and intellectuals 
from Indian traditions for black women, etc. Here I took picture from, um, this is for, uh, from their Instagram. So they are trying to make a, a revolution amongst women in Brazil. And now this tiny piece was translated in three different languages, in Spanish, in French, in English, and is circulating uh, all over the world. So it is, uh, uh, it is an individual practice in a way that you should, how it functions. You, you, you can follow your, your feminine cycle and follow the moon cycle. And you can, even if you are a man, you can see how the moon uh, can bring influence to your body, etc. So it's a very personal use that you can find of the, uh, with this, but it's also a political instrument because they invite uh, women to commit uh, in the fines to a liberation of the abortion, to uh, same-sex marriage. So all those things are very, uh, very connected. So to, to uh, finish my, my argument, uh, the main conclusions, the, the main findings uh, I have is that these new spiritualities somehow they help to draw attention to religions that are outside the main radar of sociology. For instance, we can, we can learn about indigenous religious, religious, uh, uh, religions that uh, we normally does not discuss, but that are important, that are part of, of our world. And that many female spiritualities have a strong communitarian basis. They are not just individualistic. Uh, they make sense if you belong to a community. So they, are, they, they encourage both personal and collective rituals. And somehow, if we follow the Durkheimian definition of uh, religion, they can be taken also as a form of religion if they can create a moral community. That's a, somehow a, a provocation I, I'm making about uh, this discussion. Um, and as I said before, they combine the modern ideals of autonomy and authenticity, uh, and also the respect and the effort to recover ancient traditions. They have this very tense relation with feminism, and they also have a political commitment. Well, of course, uh, um, my study was in a, a, a very specific group, so I, I'm not pretending to discuss the, the whole thing about new spiritualities, but somehow I believe this, these findings can, can be of some contribution to this, uh, to this ongoing debate. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Raquel, for this very, very interesting uh, lecture response. Um, two things uh, I th in, your, uh, in your intervention. The first one is uh, uh, an attempt uh, to create uh, a typological distinction between uh, religion and uh, spiritual, funding on the dis Durkheimian distinction between religion and uh, magic, with uh, three main points. The first one is uh, that the church um, defend some objective morals. The church is organized uh, in a hierarchical way, and the church insists on patriarchal domination. It is not the case for the spiritual world. But and it is the end of your lecture. In the spiritual world, you can have uh, a creation of communities, special communities. And uh, listening to you, I wonder if the concept of mystical network uh, by church will not be useful to explain what is going to to be created by these people. Uh, very uh, fuzzy communities with some very human 
values, but with the possibility to exit from the community, uh, with the possibility also to have some social engagement without too strong moral obligations. And uh, what Strulch had to his uh, uh, reflection is the fact that uh, uh, a mystical network could become a church at a moment of its life. And I think that uh, it could be uh, very useful to enlighten your own conference but by this point of view. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, to all the, the intervenants today. I would like to, to give the, the floor now to, to Giuseppe if he wants to, to, to give a response to this, uh, to this discussion. Just one, one word, okay. So thank you indeed, because I, yeah, I learned many things from what you said. There are no responses, by the way, to, to, to just I underline two or three things. The first one, Stefania Palmisano um, did the research on spirituality. So this is the add value, you know, more than reflection, theoretical reflection, but also did research. So, uh, um, spirituality in nature, well-being, and mystery. Uh, I would not, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, for sure in that specific social phenomenon, you see how spirituality works. But probably these, I mean, when you say well-being, you should be specific in what you mean in different social contexts, well-being, because it is different, you know, if you talk about well-being in Brazil or if you talk about well-being in Italy in some specific. Uh, according to me, um, it is true what you said about uh, some, for instance, the Italian con context where this word was very criticized at the beginning, then still, you know, it is a little bit marginalized in the scientific debate. But now, since everybody uses it, um, I think that you know, this is not the main problem. The issue is to uh, trying to show how uh, this is a new mechanism of legitimizing the relationship with the sacred. And uh, I know that some of you are doing research on this. I mean, how spirituality is working in many different uh, social ambits. So it's, uh, it's uh, I would say, it's not just something that has to do with a niche. If you say spirituality of nature, probably spirituality of nature, you know, has to do with some specific groups or but when you talk about well-being, you know, this is spread out everywhere. So, uh, at Ilesum, of course, this is a, a sign that uh, the debate on spirituality dates back well before the 60s and the 70s. But that's, you know, uh, the, the, the new thing, I think, is that uh, the, um, the spiritual approach became popular in the 60s. So this is the change. Before that, it was something, you know, very specific of certain groups, of certain personal experiences. And now it is, and by the way, it is uh, socially legitimized. This is another difference. Uh, I'm thinking, uh, since you are in Rome, probably you are familiar with the name of Giordano Bruno. Giordano Bruno had a personal spirituality. But it was extremely risky. It was not socially legitimized. And so if you go in Campo dei Fiori, you see you know, how it ended up. So um, I think that spirituality is socially legitimized in the way we understand today because of other cultural reasons, pluralism, democratization, freedom of choice, the, the, the importance of rights. So people today have rights, not only duties. Religion comes from the world of duties. Spirituality comes out from the world of rights. But anyway, we could go ahead talking about this forever. So uh, Raquel, thank you very much for what you said because your discussion added some interesting thing. You know, this uh, comparison with magic can give some suggestion to what we are saying. Authenticity and autonomy. Uh, 
Today, if you respect, when, uh, when I said that spirituality can overlap religion, I mean, you can be spiritual and religious, but you observe the um, religious commitment because you feel authentic in what you are doing. So again, the criteria of legitimizing what you do is your freedom of choice. So you, free, uh, you perceive yourself as authentic in respecting the rules, uh, the ethics, etc., etc., You do not do that because you are obedient. You do that because you feel well with yourself, which is completely different, you know. You do exactly the same thing, but the way you legitimize it is deeply different. So thanks, uh, thanks again to everybody. Uh, well, there is, there are another questions in the, in the room. Well, oh, three, four. Uh, maybe you can come here to to ask the question because uh, we have some people abroad. If uh, if it is possible. It is at it is at five o'clock. Yes, but it is at five. Five o'clock, yes. We must finish at five o'clock. Yes, but uh, don't worry. Sorry, about, well, maybe a few minutes, a few minutes plus. I, I was interested in Giuseppe's suggestion that the um, instrument of the late Charlie Glock on the dimensions of religiosity needs to be replaced. Uh, before he died, Charlie sent me his autobiography and it's sent, it is now in the hands of um, a, a scholar of Messianic Judaism background, Richard Simino, and he's developing a collection of such biographies with Columbia University's library. Uh, Charlie is very uh, explicit that uh, he was brought in to survey research after World War II because the, the scholars were financially incompetent and he had to bring order and so forth. And the genre of research began with the study of radio. And the uh, audience for radio was inactive and it was a question of fashioning products to reach them. Uh, okay, set that aside for a moment. As, as a, a Texas president of Pax Christi, I organized um, uh, protest demonstrations in military city. And I forget exactly what the protest was about. It was something military. It was like being next to this big uh, Italian Air Force building uh, here. Uh, and uh, an 81 year old uh, former army chaplain, uh, a priest, uh, was in my demonstrations, you know, we were there holding our signs quietly. And a, a youngster came up, a young man in jeans and so forth, but it turned out he was uh, a soldier. And he managed to seek this former chaplain out. I don't know how, but he went just to the right man and was saying that he was developing questions about being in the military and being trained to kill people. And uh, my friend, the priest, was very good in drawing out his concerns and, and, and bringing them out so that he could see his own concerns himself. That's spirituality. That's somebody, and, and, and the examples the commentators gave were, were, were similar that it's a biographical phenomenon. I'm not sure a new survey instrument could catch that. Uh, I, I also am in a parish with a, um, a deacon who converted from a militaristic outlook and is now a pacifist. I'm not a pacifist, but, but he is. And, and he preaches on social justice sometimes, which the clergy never do, or at least the priests never do. But his change, his conversion, that's, I think, what we mean by spirituality. Uh, and it's, in, it's within an individual. It develops on its own uh, time and space framework. And, and I, I think that each of us 
carries around our civilization, even the parts of it we disapprove of, in ourselves. And so as, as we develop our conversions, our spirituality, they are articulated with the world around us, which we may or may not share with others, you know, our, our particular take on our civilizations. I, I think we know, need to go down that biographical approach to study spirituality. Thank you very much. You want to? No. No? No? Well. Merci. Thanks to Professor Jordan and Professor Portier and the three discussants for a very rich session. Uh, I uh, wondered whether you would like to, to test the following propositions. Uh, that is, uh, this uh, raise in spirituality shouldn't be seen uh, in conjunction with the crisis of those systems who were supposed to deliver the good and they didn't. On the one hand, they established churches. On the other hand, the capitalist system, uh, if you wish, that is um, uh, both material and spiritual well-being, which uh, creates uh, some kind of disappointment, and therefore the need to search for something alternative. And so it came to my mind that uh, then you go back and you think of uh, forums that we have uh, seen from history, uh, such as uh, certain forms of syncretism, uh, and the case of Latin America is, is very important, but the case of uh, pantheism and the case of polytheism, and what we call sometimes with scorn paganism, if uh, aren't we going to rediscover that in fact there was a fundamental element of spirituality, think of the spirituality of the human body, spirituality of the animal life, spirituality of the nature and the landscape, all of these seems to me that they uh, assume a renewed, uh, renewed relevance in the context of the present discussion. Thank you. On the screen, I'm Roberto Cipriani, but I'm not Roberto Cipriani. Okay, just a few questions to address every one of you, but it's uh, five, so uh, I think uh, it doesn't call for responses, but we can discuss at the coffee. First, Giuseppe, where is Michel de Certeau in your theory? Okay, 20, year, 20 years before we had. So <laughs> I have got this question. Um, Stefania, thanks a lot. Mysticism and wisdom, these two terms brings us to something beyond religion and beyond the couple. That, okay, spirituality, religion is not, is uh, close to, etc. and so on. So this is really important to see that the semantic network is far beyond the classical opposition between religion and spirituality and something like that. And I think that the closest is wisdom. And this is something growing within the vocabulary of sociology. And there, is a, there should be something like a sociology of wisdom. This is just a remark. Uh, to Professor Valente, I forgot the first name, so I'm sorry. Um, uh, reminds me of Foucault, words and things, because you describe some things that bring me to, the, um, to this uh, remark. Is spirituality before spirituality a spirituality? And that's the problem of the categories qualifying historical phenomenon and the problem of these inner life experience, existential elements, and, um, and something like that. And finally, Raquel, okay, I'm 25 years anthropologist familiar with magic, so I will leave this aside because there are a lot of things to say about Fraser. But anyway, I'm going to something exactly in the same direction. What you described I think that 20, let's say 15 years ago, this should have been labeled new religious movement. But now this is labeled spirituality. So think about this. What should be the difference in between the two? And my final conclusion, conclusion is um, we have to be prudent because I think there's something like a fashion for spirituality impacting uh, academic circles and well, we'll have to think about that. But this was just... Thank you very en much. En passant. Thank you very much. Well, 
that's another question. Thank you. There's a comment. I thought that there is so and no place for thank you, thank you. For, for questions. Uh, probably uh, you will not be surprised with my question <laughs> uh, because I see as very problematic this combination of two notions, spirituality and new sp spirituality. I remember very well discussions, I don't know if you remember, concerning a new age that first was new age and then new new age. And you of course all are familiar with the, with the term new religious movements, uh, already they are not as new as they used to be in the 60s. So the question is what makes your concept of spirituality as the new spirituality. I think that opposition you build convincingly and interestingly, opposition between, uh, let's say, simplifying religious spirituality and this, the other forms of spirituality is not sufficient to use them the new. Uh, in the literature, there are some items showed that this new, for instance, is very closely, frequently related to, to the science, to physics, to chemics, uh, and so on. I'm interested in your answer. The last presentation, interesting uh, reference to the old discussion concerning magic and uh, religion. There were important from the perspective you took other elements like lack of organization in magic, lack of leadership in magic, uh, for instance, Weber talked about it, and uh, different attitude towards uh, sacred, uh, manipulative in magic. And maybe it's not, uh, it, it's, I find interesting idea to think about um, spirituality as having some elements borrowed from the old discussion on the magic. Thank you. Thank you very much. But if you want to come here. Thank you. Um, I have two questions, really questions, not comment, um, driven by my curiosity. I'm new in the, uh, I'm, it's not my field, uh, sociology of religion, but uh, I've, done, I've done research in the last two years on home birth and medicalization of childbirth. And as you know, uh, spiritual midwifery is uh, one of the core tests uh, in this uh, social movement, let's say. So I have two questions for Stefania Palmisano uh, and for Ra Rachel Weiss. Um, for Stefania, um, if uh, you have encountered in your case studies anything about the relationship between spirituality and medicalization and how um, a spirituality is taken by a medical establishment, for example, in hospital, uh, of course not in childbirth because you studied um, spiritual assistance, so it's related. Uh, and for Rachel, um, the question is if you came across any tension with feminism about the specific concept of motherhood. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much. And the last, maybe the last question, if you want to, to come to the, the tribune. I write uh, uh, my question, methodological questions. The autobiography of Teresa Davila is a book of primary importance in the history of the spirituality. It's full of uh, humanity and experience. This is the first question. Not what is experience, but where is experience? Second question. 
Teresa uh, writes these books after 40 years. They tell him she is possessed, possessed, the diablo. But uh, she says the, uh, in the autobiography that she just wanted to chat, wanted to chat. The question is, we can then speak of religion in Teresa or uh, we need to talk about spirituality. She say, wanted to chat. Chat is spirituality. Yes, perhaps. Third, third question in uh, Teresa, the two dimension external research or religion and uh, internal research or spirituality, external, internal work together. The question is, why make a distinction again? Why? The fundamental question is, what is dogma for you? Teresa, in your uh, autobiography, speak, she just wanted to chat. This is spirituality, this is uh, research, spirituality, this is religion. Thank you very much. Well, that was the, the last question. Yes, yes. Um, except if you have some uh, responses to, to give to the answers. No, no, we, we will reply to the answers during the coffee break because we could open another. OK. OK, that's fine. OK, thank you. Thank you very much.